Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for watching today. This is a recording of the Fickers 3 overview training. Um, this training is all about the family child care environment rating scale. And this is a recording, not for training credit. Um, feel free to pause as needed. Um, take some time to reflect. Um, watch over and over again and make sure to tell all of your family child care friends um, where to where to find this great information. So we appreciate you listening in. I do want to tell you for one moment, um, this is, again, the family child care environment rating scale uh, training today. So if you are a center-based employee, feel free to listen in. You might gain some, some great knowledge, but we will be having um, training and recordings for both the infant, toddler, and the early childhood environment rating scales. Um, so uh, those will be separate. Uh, so if you are a center-based employee, um, go ahead and, um, and watch if you'd like or, or take the time um, another time for those tools. Um, you will hear us uh, call this tool Fickers today. Um, some people call it Fickers. It's kind of like potato, potato. Um, there's no vowel there in between F and C. So um, it's kind of uh, one of those things that some people call it Fickers and some people call it Fickers. But if you're here to listen in for the family child care environment rating scale, um, you are in the right place. So get comfortable and we hope you learn a lot today. Um, first, I want to introduce myself um, and my colleagues that will be um, joining today um, for this training. I am Kristen Howard. I am the Assessment Manager for Great Start to Quality, and I will let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Jennifer Roundtree, Consultant and Trainer with Great Start to Quality. Hello, I am Haley Norris, and I am an assessor with Great Start to Quality. All right, so let's dive into some learning objectives of our time together today. Um, the goal of this uh, training is for you to become familiar with the Fecker's tool. Um, and so when we say familiar, we're not in, in expecting you to be an expert of the tool by the end of this session together. Um, it's just an overview, and there's a lot of information we're going to share together uh, in this recording. So as Kristen said, feel free to listen several times, take some notes. If you have access to the tool book, um, pull it out, highlight things that stand out to you. If you don't have access to the tool book, um, your Great Start to Quality Local Resource Center has them in their lending libraries, and we will share um, some information um, on our website where you can get the tool book. Um, but it's really just to become familiar. We know um, that this is a lot to learn and to know. Um, so we'll go over some things at a pretty high level today. We'll give you some examples of things that we've been seeing as we've been out in the field uh, and just some tips to support you in learning this tool and really helping you feel empowered to make the best choice with the new reimagined Great Start to Quality to identify if this is the tool that you wanna use in your next onsite observation. In February, 2023, you'll have that choice. Um, and then our other goals are seeing how this really ties into supporting you with a quality early learning environment and how that looks. So what does Fickers 3 identify that's high quality? What are you currently doing in your family child care setting and how that all aligns with Great Start to Quality? Um, and so those are some of the main things. Also looking at some resources uh, to continue to support you in your learning of this tool. So let's spend a moment here just to talk about why high quality is important. Uh, so we have some, some facts pulled up on this slide. Uh, and you might be very familiar with these facts because this is what you live and breathe every day and you know the research. But it's important to share this and say that we know 90% of development happens between birth and five years of age. And so what does that say to all of us? Everything that you do every day with the children in your setting is important. And so creating that high quality environment uh, is really gonna support their learning and their spark for further learning as they develop. And also look at the number of hours that 
children are in birth to five, 11,500 hours of potential learning opportunities, opportunities for you to make those connections. And so really setting the stage is important. And we will talk about how the Fickers 3 tool uh, will help you see that in your learning environment and those interactions with the children and support you in this journey. So Great Start to Quality is getting a new look. It's reimagined. And so as we share this information today, you might be looking at some of the slides and you see our logo and they look a little different. Uh, this is all part of our rebranding to align with our new mission and vision and then these core values for Great Start to Quality that you see on your screen. And we wanted to spend a moment here to really talk about how equity, quality, uh, empowering and being committed are key values of our team and how we see the Fickers 3 tool supporting you with being empowered to make a choice onto what on-site observation tool you would like to use starting in February 2023 when this is made available in the newly reimagined Great Start to Quality. Our goal is really to empower each of you to say, yes, this is a tool that I feel confident in using and wanting to learn more about, we're also providing you with another choice too. You're gonna to have a new, you're gonna have a couple of choices as a family child care provider. You can choose class or you can choose Fickers 3. And so today we're gonna to show you a little bit about Fickers and see how these tie into our core values and help you feel empowered in identifying that choice. So let's dive into it. Um, so right here on the slide, we know we use a lot of acronyms in our world. And so we see ERS-3 and FICRS-3. Well, ERS stands for Environment Rating Scale. And then the three is for the third edition. So know that Great Start to Quality is using the third edition of all of these scales. So FICRS is the one for family child care providers. And then ITERS is for infant toddler educators. And ECRS is for early childhood or our preschool friends of three to five-year-olds. So we're gonna focus on figures today, as Kristen said, for family child care. So let's talk a little bit more about this tool and what we know about it. Um, we first came out with focusing just on class for the newly reimagined Great Start to Quality. And we spent a lot of time offering trainings on class. And so um, now we, took the data and the feedback from the field that more choices would help people feel empowered. And so um, the advisory committee decided to offer the ERS suite of tools as another option for on-site observation starting in February. So on the left here, you're gonna see the three tools that we're gonna be using. Um, and so today we're focused on the Fickers, which is the green scale book. Um, and I shared earlier that we have infant toddler in the early childhood environment. These are all nationally, actually internationally known. Um, they are valid and reliable tools. Uh, they have a very uh, consistent way in collecting data to support that on-site observation and to support your coaching and your journey with kind of looking at your space, looking at your interactions and identifying some goals and ways to move forward in your continued learning. So this is just an option for all of you. And so know that the field heard this, Michigan recognized the need for another on-site observation option. And so we're introducing Figures 3 to you. And why did we do that? Because it's all about giving you high quality and high quality ties into helping you feel empowered and giving you choices. So know that at the heart of our, everything we're doing, everything we're striving for with reimagining Great Start to Quality, to giving um, access to all providers in those choices and to supporting all children and families that aligns with our mission on high quality. So Vickers 3 is, um, stands for Family Child Care Providers. Again, third edition is the one you want. Um, and we will dive into how the scale, it's called a scale, is broken into a set of subscales, and then there's items and indicators for all of those. Every um, part of the figures focuses on best practice for children 
And uh, it looks not only at the environment, but also those rich interactions that are happening between the provider in the setting and those children. So it looks at things, and we'll talk about this, such as um, your health and safety practices, to those interactions, to activities, and we'll dive deeper into uh, the scale to look at all of these items, again, at a high level to help you become familiar with this. Know that we're gonna continue to provide trainings and resources, which we'll share at the end, um, as you want to learn more about the Figures 3 tool. All righty. So before we move forward, um, I just want to mention um, that the ERS suite of tools that we've been talking about, um, you will see as a choice for on-site observation, but also you're going to see this in the reimagined process um, in the self-reflection. And this might sound new to you, or maybe you've already learned a little bit about it, um, but there is an indicator in the self-reflection um, that the program has completed the environment rating scale, the ERS-3, um, or the SELPQA self-assessment. Now, unless you are here um, as a family child care provider that only provides um, care for school-aged children, um, you would not have to worry about the SELPQA here uh, for the self-assessment. Uh, you will focus on the environment rating scale for the self-assessment um, for the indicator, um, CIL 11. Um, and again, as Jen mentioned earlier, lots of support, lots of resources. Um, your great start to quality resource center staff will be able to help guide you through um, the self-reflection and indicators. But we did want to highlight um, that this tool will be used for an indicator. All right, so now we're going to take a dive into the book and we are going to start with the explanation of terms. So in these next few slides, we're going to be going over the terms that you will see used throughout the scale. Our first term here is accessible, um, a word that you will see used throughout the scale, especially in activities. For materials to be considered accessible, they must be within view and reach of children. Children should be able to freely take materials off of the shelves. Um, if materials are, closed, are stored in closed spaces, such as closets or locked storage closets, um, cabinets, I apologize, uh, they can only be considered accessible if it's observed that children can freely access and use those materials. We understand that you're probably storing materials um, so they can be rotated throughout the year, and that's totally okay. But we won't need to take a look at those if the children won't be using them during the observation. So on this slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about accessibility among the age groups. Um, young infants who cannot sit unsupported, they're not required to have a constant access to all toys and materials due to their limited skills. However, some access to appropriate materials with provider assistance should be observed, even if they don't have access to every material. Um, this can include um, providers holding infants in laps and showing them rattles, um, stuffed toys, books, um, things of that nature. For non-mobile infants who can sit unsupported, access to more materials is required. So the provider should either bring materials to the children or move the children to within reach of the materials. And then obviously mobile children should be able to move freely throughout the space and have the ability to reach and access materials of their choice throughout the entire observation. Um, one thing to note is that if children spend more than an hour of the observation in an outdoor space, materials should still be accessible outdoors as well as indoors. Next, we're gonna take a look at these restrictive furnishings. So we're all aware young children need more individualized treatment and they may require more holding or cuddling, um, more soothing from the provider and sometimes placements and seats such as, such as high chairs, cribs, swings, extra saucers uh, to help calm and soothe them. 
So while they may need to use these furnishings, they should not be placed in these restricted items for long periods of time. Uh, they should be taken out and held and soothed by their provider as necessary. Even if infants do seem to be content in these furnishings, they really need to be placed around the space um, to really get that gross motor in. Thanks, Haley. So let's continue through learning some of these terms that you're going to see or hear about in your journey of learning the FICRS 3 tool. Um, our goal with having time to dive into the terms used in the tool is to create the space of a common language. So when your coach at your Great Start to Quality Local Resource Center, or if you get a report from one of our amazing assessors um, after having a FICRS on-site observation done, has some of these terms in it, um, it's that common language to support you in your learning. So let's talk about LAPS. Um, as we see on this slide, this is just a definition of what lapse means, an integral or passage of time. And so how this looks in use of thinking about lapse in time um, or um, materials uh, within uh, your setting is thinking about um, when you're transitioning children. So we know, we definitely know that family child care providers are often on your own. You're very busy. You've got a lot of things. Sometimes some children need more attention than others, um, but it's avoiding that lapse and that access as Haley called out um, to material. So let's say, for example, you're getting children prepared to go outdoors and it takes some time. As we all know, we experience winter in Michigan that it takes time to get the kiddos ready. And so instead of having children that are prepared and ready to go out, you know, kind of feeling roaming or getting uh, distracted. Um, maybe there's, you know, some things that transpire with other children. They're just, they're not engaged, right? Um, so thinking about labs is like, how can you continue to provide them access to materials in the space um, while you're helping other children prepare a transition? So in those transition times. Uh, the other image here is of this child waiting for their food, right? Um, so thinking about having food prepared, um, having children part of that process and setting the table or preparing the food, um, having activities or experiences, maybe a basket with some books at the table. Uh, this also, this lapse uh, is something to consider when having children wash their hands or using the restroom or having to wait. So just thinking about how to fill that space to support children in still staying engaged, having access to materials, and really limiting those distractions that can happen if children have to wait for a long period of time, especially for those youngers. We know how toddlers are with that. So weather permitting here, this is another big one. We live in Michigan, we experience all sorts of weather. Um, and so let's talk about how this looks in terms of figures and what the assessor uh, will be mindful of when they come, on, um, come out to conduct the on-site observation. We know best practices, children need time outdoors every day. Uh, when I taught in preschool, I always thought of it as there's no bad weather, just bad clothing. We try to get children out as much as we can. Uh, there's a huge benefit for children to having time uh, playing in the snow, experiencing all sorts of weather, right? But the main things to keep in mind is that there's no public health warning due to temperatures that are too high or too low, such as, and I really wanna call this word out, active participation. Um, so when we talk about that, we think about torrential rain, heavy, heavy, heavy snow. Um, and so if it's raining a little, sprinkling, if there's some snow flurries um, and you can get kiddos outside safely, go for it. Um, but if it is torrential rain in the morning, <clears throat> excuse me, in the afternoon, uh, it starts to clear up, think about modifying your schedule uh, so that those children can experience time outdoors because we know it's a benefit not only to them uh, for physical experience, but also socially and mentally uh, to spend time outdoors as it is for all humans, really. Uh, so think about those modifications that might be needed. Okay, engaged. I'm gonna pause for one second here as I get a drink because I have a just a bit of a tickle here in my throat and I need to get through this slide. <laughs> so it happens. Um, so engaged, <clears throat> what do we mean when we're talking about engaged? 
So as you look at these photos on this slide, um, I, we hope as we put this slide deck together, these capture children that are truly engaged and how this looks within your setting, right? So it's children that are not just well-behaved and sitting quietly, but children that are actively learning, feeling connected, that serve and return, that back and forth, where children are wanting to be a part of that experience and that adult in the setting is providing those opportunities for children to learn and to be engaged. And this isn't just only what happens indoors, but thinking about outdoor engagement as well. Um, it, when we are taking children outdoors, if you're going on a nature walk, how are you and the other adults in the study active participants to support those children through that learning experience? So that's what we're talking about engaged. It's, it means a lot more than just well-behaved children sitting quietly. Um, it's that active learning, those serve and return and back and forth exchanges that we know are key for them. Ample. So we've talked a lot about access and preventing that lapse. And now we're gonna talk about ample. And this means not only in terms of space, but in materials. And if you have a scale book or if you get a scale book and you're listening to this recording, um, these definitions we're pulling out are from page 12, 13, 14. Uh, so you'll see those explanation of terms. You can dive in there and take some notes and pay attention if you follow along um, to this. And so what are we talking about here? Well, we know that children need space, ample space to move freely, uh, to be able to build block structures that are safe and secure, and that it's not a bunch of children on top of each other, like a child accident just like moves and they bump into another child or they knock the child because there's not enough space. Um, and so how does that look in the terms of what the on-site um, observation that assessor would be viewing is they're going to think in terms, um, because they will ask you this question, they're going to think in terms of the maximum number of children that you are allowed to have that day of that observation. So when they're thinking of ample space, if your maximum number of children is six, but they're only observing two, keep in mind they're going to be thinking of ample space for six children. So can children move freely? Are they overcrowded? Is it overstimulating? Um, so keep that in mind. With materials, ample materials, um, enough um, for children not to have issues fighting over materials. Um, and so thinking about your environment and having ample materials that they're organized, accessible, easy for children to access, and that there's an ample amount. So if all the children are really interested in building blocks that day, there's enough materials for them and space to build those blocks. All righty, we are gonna keep moving forward, plugging away um, with the scale itself. And we're gonna just kind of go over um, a little overview of the Vickers 3 scale. So um, there is a scale structure and um, you're going to see there's the specific scale, so the thicker three, there's subscales, items, and indicators. And it's all broken down. You can kind of think of um, each thing is broken down into similar items grouped together. Um, you can kind of think of the subscales as like chapters in a novel. Um, but I really just want you to, to know you don't need to get caught up in a lot of this terminology. You're going to hear us use these words. Um, and it's not any terminology that you will need to know, but it is helpful to know how the scale is set up. All right, we are now going to talk about the subscales. So here's some of the, getting into some of the nitty gritty of, of the tool. Um, this scale is broken down into subscales. And those subscales for the Fickers 3 are space and furnishings, personal care routines, language and books, activities, interaction, and program structure. And you will see under each of those, um, they're broken down even further um, and, and two items. So I'm gonna just take a pause for a quick second so you have time to look at this slide. Um, again, if you need to pause and look at this further, um, this is taken directly out of page 15 of the toolbook. 
Um, so if you have access to a book, again, you don't do not have to, um, but this is taken from page 15 if you are following along and you do have a, a book. All right, we're going to get into each of these things a little bit more. Um, so now we're going to um, get in to some of the indicators. Um, so you will see the 1.1, 1 1.2, 3.1, 3.2, 3.1. Oop, there's a little typo there. It should say 3.3. Um, again, this is something um, don't get too caught up in um, the terminology of indicators and that type of thing you're going to see across the top. Um, inadequate, minimal, good, and excellent. And we're going to go into that a little deeper further on in this training. That is the scoring. Um, Fickers 3, um, as all the ERS tools, are on a 1 to 7 um, scale for scoring. Um, but right now, we're really going to look at this um, display for children. All right, so you're going to see the item display for children. Under each of that um, is an indicator, and that is going to give more specific information to things that we're looking for. Um, so again, go ahead and pause your recording if you'd like. If you'd like to look at this in more detail, we are going to um, go into more detail on a lot of these things. Um, this is just a sample. So this display for children here is just a sample on how um, the indicators are organized. There are notes for clarification. Um, those notes can be found on the ERSI website and um, we will tell you later how you can access, um, again, the RC website and the tools, but um, really just know um, that this is something that clarifies the expectations. This is something that the assessor that comes to do uh, the on-site observation um, will be looking closely at because these notes give specific information um, about requirements for different ages, different examples of materials, um, guidelines around keywords. So um, those things can be found um, on the ERSI website um, if you need more detailed information. All right, well, thanks, Kristen, for that general overview um, on how the scale is set up. And now we're gonna start diving into the subscales and items in the book. But we won't be digging too much in each indicator, but rather pointing out key pieces that we feel are important to know from each item. So our first subscale here is space and furnishings. Here we'll take a look at indoor space, furnishings, arrangement of indoor space, and displays. So indoor space, um, here we're looking at all spaces within the home used by the children during the observation. The amount of space that the children have to use for their play is important because it influences the number and types of activities that children can effectively engage in at the same time. There should be enough space for children and adults to move freely and for many play materials to be accessible at the same time. The condition of the space is also important because it can affect the comfort and health of the children and adults in the program. Here, we're thinking of comfort in terms of light, temperature and ventilation, and noise level. This includes heating and air conditioning systems in the spaces used by children, windows or doors that can provide natural light into the space and that can be safely opened, and ceiling fans. Um, the space should also be in good repair and easy to maintain and clean. There should be evidence of daily cleaning of surfaces, including floors and tables, um, diapering areas, toilets, um, furniture should also be stable and in good repair. And generally, there should be no repair problems that present health and safety risks. Furnishings is looking at the furniture used by the children for routine care, play, and learning activities. Basic furniture for routine care includes appropriately sized tables and chairs for children, cubbies for storage of children's personal belongings located at the children's level, um, child sized shelving for storing toys and materials and furniture that promotes self-help, um, which could be steps at the changing table or steps at a sink. Um, it's also looking at soft furnishings. 
The arrangement of indoor space is used by the children affects how well the providers can enhance children's learning and supervise them to protect their well being. The arrangement of furniture and materials in a room organizes the play space for children. Materials should be placed for easy access by children and should be organized by type for productive use. The provided space should allow different kind of play activities to go on at the same time. Um, for example, there should be a space for children to be able to read quietly or play individually on their own. Um, and another space if children decide they wanna dance as a group. Um, the arrangement of the space should also allow for visual supervision of children. This means providers should be able to hear and respond to problems quickly. Um, providers should be able to see most children by glancing around and the provider should circulate through the space to check on children who are out of view. Um, this is especially important for infants that may be napping in another room. And our last item is displays. So the primary purpose for displaying materials um, within the space used by the children is to extend the children's learning experiences. Meaningful materials that are of interest to the children should be displayed where children can easily see them. Um, this can include family photographs, um, posters of shapes, uh, the calendar, um, pictures of children engaged in play. Um, displays should be intentional and should be viewed as a learning tool and an integral part of the children's learning environment. Talk to the children about the displays. Have conversations about the displayed content. Um, point and label items and displays for younger children. Uh, really get those children involved in the things that are displayed around the room. Um, don't just slap up some pictures just to add color. Make those displays really meaningful. Our next subscale we're going to look at is personal care routines. Personal care routines refer to the times when children are eating toileting or carrying out tasks related to those basic routine times. Our first item here is meals and snacks. Children should be offered nutritious foods throughout the day. The USDA meal guidelines are the national standards for serving nutritious foods to young children in the United States and are used by the FICRS tool to ensure foods are, that are served in the program are nutritionally adequate. You will see this across all tools. Uh, most meal times are also a time that should be pleasant for the children with appropriate teaching provided. Name the foods that the children are eating. Help the children count crackers as they place them on their plates. Sit down with the children and really enjoy their company. Our next item looks at diapering and toileting. So maintaining sanitary conditions during diapering and toileting routines is necessary to minimize the spread of germs. Um, proper sanitizing requirements includes proper hygiene and diapering and toileting for both children and providers, and includes the diapering service being cleaned and sanitized between uses. Um, one thing that we've been noticing as we've been going out, um, especially with younger children, and we're noticing providers helping younger children wash their hands and then moving on as if the provider also washed the hands with the children. Um, while we understand your hands are getting clean as you're helping these younger children, it's really important that after helping that child wash their hands, that you as a provider wash your hands as well. Diapering and toileting should almost always be individualized according to the children's needs. Um, I know it's easy to just have scheduled toileting times listed on your daily schedule and your routine. Um, however, we know as adults, we don't all have to use the bathroom at the same time. Um, so really those infants should be checked frequently um, and older children should really have access to the bathroom as needed. And careful and pleasant supervision should occur among the provider and children. And you should engage in some one-on-one -on -one teaching. Talk to younger children about what you're doing and why. Uh, go over the hand washing steps while washing hands together. Our next item here is health practices. Um, this item includes issues related to hand hygiene, sanitary nap provisions, and teaching children how to keep themselves healthy. Um, any of these health aspects related to meals or diapering and toileting, they're not handled here um, as they're handled above, as just mentioned. So we know much effort should be made to uh, decrease the spread of germs. Space and, space and furnishing should be clean. 
Mouth toys should always be removed before being placed into play where other children can grab them. Um, noses should be wiped when needed and hands cleaned afterwards. Um, hand hygiene should always be appropriately carried out. Um, and here's one that's a little different. Cribs and cots should be appropriately spaced. Um, here for meeting the minimal level of three, we're looking for cribs and cots to be 18 inches apart. And to meet the good level of five, um, they really should be placed at least 36 inches apart. And again, remember to use these times for positive teaching interactions with the children. Um, when setting up cots for a rest time, give children a ruler and help them have them help you measure. It will be one less thing taken off your plate that you need to do. And then our last item here is safety practices. So the intent of this item is to lower the risk of injury of children by minimizing hazards and providing adequate supervision for the age and ability of the children in the group. During the observation, both indoor and outdoor safety hazards will be considered. So there are three types of haz hazards uh, looked at within this tool. So an extreme safety hazard is one which poses an immediate threat to the life and safety of the children. A major safety hazard is one where the risk of serious injury is very high. Um, this could include um, infants not being strapped into their high chairs. And a minor hazard, either one where the consequences would not be great or an accident really is not likely. So the spaces used by the children should be set up to avoid safety problems. And children should be given simple explanations as to why they cannot do unsafe things. For example, um, please keep your feet on the floor, Will. I don't want you to fall and get hurt. Provider supervision should be adjusted based on the relative risks and behavior of the children. Um, for example, if you have a child that's a biter, stay close to them. Um, if children are using climbing equipment, um, they should be closely supervised. And remember, you know your home and your children best. We know that you're, no one wants injuries and we're doing our best to prevent them at all costs. So our next subscale here is language and books. Um, quite a few items here and a lot of information. Our first item is talking with children. So we know that talking with children builds language and communication skills. You can talk with children anytime, anywhere, and about anything. There should be frequent informal talking throughout the observation during play and routines. Personalize the talk with children with one-on-one -on -one conversations. Use the children's name, make eye contact, and talk about things that they're doing or what they might be interested in. Talk in a playful way babble with the babies, um, joke around with the older children. Encouraging vocabulary and development. So it's important to encourage vocabulary in young children so they can develop those language and literacy skills. Use a wide range of words appropriate to the ages and abilities of the children. Use specific names for people, places, things, actions, and descriptive words as children experience them in routines and play. Use the items in your environment to introduce no, new words. Talk about past and future experiences. And add information or ideas to the words that children use. Responding to children's communication builds and strengthens relationships between children and their caregivers. In order to respond to children's communications, the provider must frequently be close enough that children can communicate easily. You should really be responding to both verbal and nonverbal communication from the children. Response to children's communication should always be positive. Show interest in their communication. Pay close attention. Give, emo give appropriate emotional response about a child's idea, such as smiling or showing excitement or concern. And provide a relaxed environment that encourages children to vocalize or talk throughout the day and help children say words that they may be having trouble communicating. Encouraging children to communicate. Conversations and questions should be used with children of all ages, even young infants. Obviously, the level of conversation and questioning will depend on the ages and developmental levels of the children observed. 
Conversations can include verbal and nonverbal turn-taking. Providers should initiate conversations with children during both routines and play. Ask questions and give children time to answer those questions. Always make sure those questions are age appropriate. Personalize those questions or those conversations and help children communicate with one another. Ask children to use their words if fighting over a toy or remind children to say excuse me when trying to move past another child. So these last two items, we're gonna start looking at the use of books. First item here is provider use of books with children. So using books with children helps to develop a close and enjoyable relationships with books, which is a vital step towards literacy. In order to develop an interest in books, books should be interesting to the children and providers and children should be actively engaged in the use of books. Providers should use books formally and informally and book shot times should always be pleasant. Read along with the children during story, story time. At free choice, sit with a child and read books that the child chooses. Encourage children to turn the pages. Uh, use your finger to follow the printed words as you read. Discuss the photos in the book. Point to pictures and add information. Relate what's in the book to children's experiences. Show interest and enjoyment in books when used with children. Laugh or smile at appropriate times in the story. Show enthusiasm when talking about pictures. Use different voices for different characters. Always make sure book times are attractive to the children and allow them to leave if they're not interested. And lastly, encouraging children's use of books. Um, this item is really looking to see that books are accessible throughout the day and that they're age appropriate for the children in care. So a variety of books should be accessible to children during the day. There should be at least 10 books accessible with at least three for each age group observed. Obviously, obviously the more you have, the better. Um, books should be easy to reach and use and not crowded on a shelf or in a big pile. Um, for non-mobile infants, place books on the floor within the child's reach. Um, give positive attention to children when they're using books independently. Make comments about how they're reading or how you notice that they pointed to um, the words in the photos. And always rotate those books to keep the children interested in reading. All right. Thanks, Haley. That was a lot. That's so, a lot. I, I think Haley needs a little bit of a break here because uh, she just shared a lot of information. And again, we want you to hold into your mind that might be feeling a little overwhelmed right now. This is just to get you familiar with the tool, with the scale. Um, and so we're going through the subscales and the items. So the next subscale that we're going to talk about are activities. So we're going to talk about fine motor, art, music and movement, blocks, dramatic play, nature science, math numbers, appropriate use of screen time, promoting acceptance of diversity and gross motor. That's a lot. Um, <clears throat> and as we go through these, uh, just know that we are gonna give you some examples. We're gonna talk um, at, about these items briefly and share maybe some things we noticed as we've been out in the field, <clears throat> but continue to think about the questions you have, uh, your learning, and, and then we strongly encourage you to reach out to your Great Start Quality uh, Coach at your local resource center. We know, please hold on to the fact too, this isn't starting until February 2023, um, but we don't know when you're watching this. Maybe it's March and you're watching this and you have questions. So uh, just reach out with those. They're happy to help you. All right. So let's look at these items, fine motor art and music and movement. Uh, we're going to start with fine motor. And so the thing to keep in mind or things I should say as we go through these is within your setting, when we talk about these items, uh, please be mindful of the ages of the children that you can have in your setting um, and having these items available for them and how that looks. So what is age appropriate when we're thinking of fine motor for infants? Uh, so thinking about busy boxes, nested cups, containers to dump and fill, textured toys, cr um, cradle gyms, household items can be fine motor such as graduated measuring cups, pots with lids, 
um, that is something that can be used. Um, and so as we share uh, information and we share suggestions for items for these, um, we're not saying that you have to go out and spend a ton of, we know budgets are tight, um, but get creative, uh, get ideas with other family child care providers. Uh, Pinterest was always fun. Get creative, see what you have within your home, uh, Goodwill, um, and just think about other ways that you can provide these experiences if cost is a factor as well. Um, think if you have toddlers, pre-K, school age, how does fine motor look for them? So for toddlers, you might have some simple puzzles, some pop beads, some stacking rings. Preschool, we're talking about more jigsaw puzzles, more complicated pegs with peg boards, links and gears, um, stringing beads. Maybe it's something as simple as cutting up straws and, and, and lace, lacing them, stringing them um, on string if you have school agers. Um, think about those experiences. Maybe you have some Lincoln logs or marbles out or small computer games and more complex jigsaw puzzles. Um, so when you're setting up your space too, uh, it's important that the materials are well organized, uh, easy to access, there's that word again, uh, and uh, that there's choices for children with fine motor. It's not just one thing and all children are fighting over it uh, or wanting it. Remember, we wanna have an ample amount of materials too. Um, so many and varied choices. And uh, it's not only having these materials present in your setting, it's about how you uh, and anyone within your family child care program is providing uh, that back and forth exchange, frequently talking with children about their play and materials, helping children how to learn the materials. So you're uh, demonstrating, modeling those pieces. You're showing children perhaps how to interlock blocks together, how to string beads. Uh, these are really important things for understanding this concept of fine motor. Uh, if our goal is to support children's learning, uh, to have that engagement, that organic engagement happen, uh, it's twofold. It's, it's the use of the materials, but it's also in how you're using the materials, how you're having those conversations and supporting them in those pieces. So keep that in mind, uh, not just with fine motor, but as we go through all of these activities that we're gonna talk about here. All right, let's talk a little bit about art. So, um, Individual expression is really important with art. It's more than just a craft or cookie cutter art where everything looks the same and everyone is expected to have the same outcome of whatever it is. Everyone's house that they're creating needs to look the same. Um, if you have children 18 months and older, you have art materials accessible uh, and easy for them to access. Um, and also that children are not required to participate. If you have a, if you have an art experience, but you have a child who isn't interested, you're not forcing or making them doing that, but providing them that alternate activity. Uh, you're supervising that experience. So you're having those conversations. You're talking to the children as they're doing the art. If a child draws a picture and shows it to you, you're saying, oh, tell me about what you're drawing. Um, I see you used a lot of brown, or I see you put a lot of circles. Tell me about it. Um, and then maybe transcribing a little bit, writing down what the child's saying with their permission, perhaps on the back or in a notebook and saying, oh, can I write that down? Or let's think of a title for your drawing and then displaying it. Having children have a space in your setting to display their artwork. Um, you're talking about um, how children are using art materials. Um, and so thinking about how to facilitate that, you're, you're leading that experience, you're facilitating it, um, and that there are accessible art materials um, that have many choices for children. So it's not just crayons out and paper, perhaps you have markers and some watercolor, maybe there's Play-Doh out, uh, different types of scissors or tape for children, having an art rich environment so those children can have that individual expression and having those conversations with the children about those art experiences. And being mindful, my son was one of these kids, art was not his thing. Uh, he would choose to be over at the blocks or the cars or the ramps or something. Um, and so allowing children, if they're not interested, uh, to have an alternate activity available. All right, let's talk about music and movement. So having 
music and movement in your setting. Um, so having at least maybe 10 appropriate music materials, thinking again about the ages of the children in your setting uh, and what music materials would be appropriate for them. So infants, maybe you have some rattles or grasping toys. Um, toddlers, you have things um, as drums with sticks, a xylophone with a mallet, maybe you have a toy piano. In preschool, maybe you have a bongo drum, um, maybe you have um, a realistic toy piano out. Um, so thinking about different things for the ages of the children for those music experiences. Um, and then about your participation in those music and movement experiences. You're encouraging children to sing along or to dance. But again, we're not forcing them. So if you provide a music or movement activity um, and a child is not interested, they're not forced to do it. They have an alternate activity, so um, they can choose something else. You're allowing children to be creative in their music and movement. We all sometimes have ideas on how things should be used. Um, and as long as it's safe, if a child has a different way to use a rhythm stick or a scarf while dancing, maybe they want to make up some new words and be silly with singing a song, those are all encouraged. And then again, if you're having those conversations during music and movement activities, you're pointing out features of the music. You're talking to children about rhyming words or fast and slow tempos, um, high and low tones. You're using um, finger plays to connect movements. Um, so really being an active participant in those music and movement experiences with children. Another thing to note with music movement, um, if you have loud background music playing, um, be mindful of it, that can interfere with children. Um, and so, if you're going to play music, you're intentional about it. If it's in the background, um, if it's something a child requests, that feels supportive to the children. But if it's just loud and distracting, uh, it, and it, it's, it's not productive to the children. So we want to see those music and movement activities happening um, and that they're pleasant and that the children appear uh, to be engaged. That's important. And so when we think about engaged, thinking about how children aren't just listening and being well-behaved, but how we're making them active, active participants in all of that. All right, we've got some more activities here. So let's talk about blocks, dramatic play, nature science, and math and number. So again, as we go through all of these things and you're taking your notes or you're reflecting on how this looks in your setting uh, and with our goal of being familiar, not being an expert, uh, just think about what you're currently doing, how you already use blocks in your space. And uh, it's important to have blocks accessible to children. Um, so it's not like just a minute, I have to go get the blocks and you go to a lock cabinet or you have to reach high on a shelf. When Haley shared about accessible, blocks should be accessible. Uh, there should be clear space. Children need clear space. So when we think about that ample space, for children in block play, uh, that they can build their block structures and not have a child just walk simply walk by or feeling overcrowded and things get knocked down, um, and that you're showing interest in the block play of the children. You're helping children to build that block tower. You're asking a child uh, what they might do with the blocks today, um, and that there's potentially many different types of blocks. Um, again, get creative with those block materials. Um, we've seen things, uh, Kristen and Haley shared, they saw Kleenex boxes with um, pictures of families on them taped up uh, with the white, the clear tape that were pretty sturdy, those Kleenex boxes and put in the block area for children to use as blocks. Uh, so get creative with those ideas. Um, blocks and accessories are gathered together and they're sorted by type. So having accessories in your block area, um, making sure again that 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 space is out of the main traffic area and that it will support the maximum number of children you can have uh, and that you're interested in talking to children as well about that. Also within blocks, there's opportunity for math talk. So maybe you're naming the shapes of the blocks as you're building together. You're counting how many blocks were used. Um, maybe you're measuring how tall some a block structure is. There's all sorts of opportunities to really extend um, math within that those block uh, environments and thinking about that learning as well. All right, dramatic play. <clears throat> 
So having dramatic play in your setting is very important. Again, we think about those high quality environments and helping children uh, build those connections and have opportunities to be creative uh, and really participate in rich dramatic play. So having those props and thinking again about the ages of the children in that setting and having dramatic play items that are uh, appropriate for the ages. Um, preschoolers, uh, if you have preschool children in that setting, uh, look, we're looking for dress ups and we're not just looking for princess dress ups or <clears throat> all the same type, but uh, having a variety of dress ups that uh, are gender neutral. So uh, construction workers, you know, allowing the girls and boys being construction workers, right? Uh, it's, it's thinking about all of those pieces um, and the importance of having access to, to dramatic play. And also thinking about dramatic play opportunities in the outdoor environment. So maybe it's a basket that you take out with some kitchen materials. Maybe you take the dress ups outside. It's not that they have to stay outside, but how they can be added to your outdoor learning uh, and allowing um, that experience for children outdoors as well. And also being an active participant in dramatic play, asking questions, showing a child maybe how to set a table or cook something in the kitchen area, you're playing along, you're, you're engaged and you're supporting them in their learning through dramatic play use. Nature and science. So um, this item uh, really looks at how you create or have within your setting nature and science materials. So thinking about potentially having nature and science books or games, animals. Um, maybe you have some plants indoor. Maybe you have a basket with pine cones or different types of rocks. Perhaps you have a garden in your setting. Um, maybe you're growing something indoors with the children. It's also not only having those materials, but talking about them. Let's say it starts raining in the morning and you're talking about the weather with children and what, what kind of rain it is. And um, when, when they might be able to go outdoors. Um, getting those young children, having infants and toddlers have access to nature and science experiences as well. And um, talking about that, right? Perhaps you're outdoors and you see some dew on the grass. So you're talking to the children about what might've caused that condensation and, and the dew. And um, maybe a child comes in and they're really excited about the moon that last night. And so you're having those conversations with them. Um, you're supporting that curiosity and really extending that learning um, through nature and science. And we're gonna talk about math and numbers here. So again, uh, thinking of the ages of the children, having math and number materials in your setting for them, uh, having them well organized and accessible, um, that there are some print numbers that can be accessed by children and that show pictures of quantity. So maybe you have a picture with the number two and then you have like two circles by it so that they can see, yes, this shows, this represents two. Um, and that you're talking about math concepts with children. So um, as they're setting the table for a snack, you're counting with them the number of cups they're putting out. Um, perhaps as a child is washing their hands and you're saying, how long, let's count how long we take to wash our hands. You're counting with them as they wash their hands. Um, maybe they're doing an activity with pegs and you're with the child the number of pegs they're putting into a board. Um, again, um, encouraging children to use math, math talk and to have those meaningful conversations where that learning is happening. Um, so perhaps it's something as you ask a child how old they are and they say four and you're like, hmm, can you show me four fingers? And the child holds up four fingers and you're like, yeah, let's do that together. So you're modeling with the child and you're counting. Let's count one, two, three, four as you count along with the fingers. Um, and so just really encouraging, um, sparking that continued learning and seeing math and numbers being used within your setting and looking for those opportunities to help children see and learn that as well. All right, thank you, Jen. We're rounding out um, activities here and we really wanna call out um, the next one, appropriate use of screen time. 
So while everyone is uh, not necessarily using screens, screens are um, being used sometimes. And so we wanted to give some guidance um, on how um, screens should, um, what it should look like for this particular tool. So um, first and foremost, if screens are not used during the three hour observation, um, the assessor can score this in NA. It's not applicable. Um, you didn't use screens and it won't count for or against the score. So it can be an NA if screens are not used. Um, screens should not be used with children under two. And there should be three alternate activities available. Remember, we're talking all about that access, right? Children, children shouldn't be forced um, to do something um, that they don't want to do. There should be something else for them to do if they don't want to do a screen activity. Um, we've kind of been touching on that with all the things you probably are gathering um, some of these things together, right? Um, there should just always be some, some alternate activities. Um, screen time should be limited to 20 minutes max. A lot of folks um, have said um, in regards to screen time, right? Like kids are getting screen time at home. So we want to make sure that we're really um, not doing over 20 minutes uh, while they're in your, in your care. Um, and then the big one, right? Like Haley and Jen have mentioned with all the activities, this is about the staff being involved with children using technology. So it's not turning something on and walking away. It's really guiding those experiences and getting involved um, with the children um, as they use technology. So a couple of things to note. Um, when we're talking about screens, we're talking about all audiovisual devices. So we're talking about TVs, but we're also talking about tablets and computers and um, all types of screens. So um, just be mindful of that. Um, that your TV would count, even if it's on in another room and the children are walking by um, to go outside, let's say, um, that screen is visible to them. So you really want to, to make note of that. Um, everything on a screen should always be appropriate. Um, it should never ever include violence or antisocial behavior. Um, and then remember, we are considering all the content that is viewed, including commercials. So if there is a TV or a YouTube or something like that, um, really be mindful that a lot of commercials um, might have negative messages, such as encouraging children to eat unhealthy foods or those violence or antisocial things come in on commercials all the time. So really being mindful of all the things that are on the screens. All right. And now we're gonna go into diversity. So you are going to see a lot of samples here on your screen. Um, and this is something that we should be seeing in your program. But I want to mention, these are examples. These are not things that we have to see. These are just to give you um, an idea of some things that we could see um, during our observation that would fulfill this um, particular activities item of of diversity. So um, we're looking at the different babies, right? Skin tones, different skin colors. We're looking at um, displays. So um, showing in your displays, maybe um, kids or adults of differing, differing abilities, um, different cultures, um, books. Hopefully you have lots of diversity in the books that you have out for your children. Um, pretend play food, right? Um, there's lots of different foods out there um, to represent different cultures. And really just thinking about all the different ways that you can um, have diversity in your program. It's so important that children have access to this at a young age. Um, so really being mindful and intentional of the things that you're putting out. Um, so that um, the children have access to diverse materials. Alrighty, gross motor. So you might be thinking, 
this might just be incorporated when the children go outside. They're running and playing and, and doing all the things, but we are also looking at gross motor indoors, right? So think way back at the beginning of the training when Haley was talking about restrictive devices, right? This kind of goes hand in hand because look at these um, mobile babies, right? They need time out of those devices to move their bodies freely. So we are looking at gross motor. We are looking outside. We are looking at running and playing and skipping and um, having trikes and climbing things, but we're also looking at that indoor space. Do the older children have room to move about and freely dance and use their body? And, and are you encouraging that and maybe setting that example, um, joining along in that play, um, but also for the youngest in your care? Are they able to use their large muscles and be able to, to move around and not be in those restrictive devices? Um, you'll see here a couple examples, right? Um, the children need to be able to move their bodies and have that gross motor um, play, um, again, indoors and outdoors that we will be looking at. All right, so our next subscale we'll take a look at is interaction. Um, interactions refer to the ways in which the provider relates to the children in their care. As you've heard throughout our presentation thus far, we're really looking at interactions happening throughout all parts of the day. So our first item here is supervision of gross motor play. Um, Kristen just kind of touched base on that activity. It's considered both indoors and outdoors. Um, children should be allowed to move freely, um, as mentioned, inside and outside. Um, and as a provider, you should help them develop new skills and use more challenging equipment. Um, this could be just offering a walking device for an, an infant who's learning to walk so they can push it around the space. Um, and supervise the children carefully to protect their safety and avoid injury. Next is supervision of play and learning non-gross motor. So this supervision should be adjusted appropriately for different ages and abilities, and the provider should act to avoid problems among children before they occur. Um, for example, we all know that toddlers are more impulsive um, and usually need more to be within closer reach of a provider than preschool children. Providers should show interest and appreciation for what children do and should initiate activities or experiences for the children. But also allow these children to play on their own if that's what they choose to do. Circulate among the children when engaged in free play and individualize your supervision. If a toddler is using materials with small pieces, they're gonna need more supervision than a toddler building with blocks. Provider children interaction includes both verbal and nonverbal communications between um, adults and children. Positive in individual interactions should occur with all children in the group. Um, providers should initiate interactions with children who don't request attention in addition to those who do. Um, Almost everywhere has that one child that likes to play by themselves, likes to keep to themselves, but those children really do deserve to have your attention as well. Um, be understanding, soothing, and supportive with children and be sensitive to those children's nonverbal cues. Show playfulness or appropriate humor with children um, and have, just have fun with them. Provide physical warm and, warmth and touch, hug, hold, rock, pat, and give children access to snuggle you. Use varied physical touch to match moods, personalities, or preferences. Um, hug children that you know are receptive. Um, and for those that may not like hugs, come up with a certain handshake or give high fives. Encourage gentle touches among the children. And sit on the floor with the children and make yourself physically accessible. Uh, when sitting at the children's level, you create a safe space for them. Guiding children's behavior. Providers should positively guide children's behaviors. Um, we know misbehaviors will happen. They're children. Um, just make sure you provide choices, um, give redirection, and give warnings. Use positive methods of guiding behavior. Um, to stop the running inside, take the children outside to, to run. Um, help children use a timer uh, to encourage turn taking. 
Give children attention when they're behaving well and playing. Thank them for sharing or using their walking feet. Help children become aware of their actions and how they affect others. Um, you can tell that child that may have taken a toy from the other child. You know, Billy, it, it made Susie feel sad when you took that ball. Really label those feelings. Always make sure expectations for children are appropriate. Children should be watched closely and redirected promptly. Transitions should be handled quickly. Um, have duplicate toys ready and um, more than one set of materials accessible. And for those that are familiar with uh, Think Conflict Resolution, help children learn to communicate and to solve problems and always follow up to make sure the problem solved. And our last item here is interactions among children. This is really those peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Um, providers should facilitate children's attempts to interact with children as needed. Um, as I mentioned before, talk about feelings, um, talk about children's actions or intentions. Initiate some opportunities for children to work or play together. Uh, show, show toddlers how to roll a ball to each other. Encourage older children to read a book to younger children. Um, this is also a great place to maybe help take a little bit of work off your hands when getting children ready for outside time. Place an older child with a younger child and encourage the older child to help the younger child get dressed um, to head outside. All right, our next subscale is program structure. Here we look at schedule and transitions. So we know that a schedule is the sequence of events experienced by the children during the observation. And a transition is the time spent between different activities. Um, the schedule should meet the needs of the children and provider, the provider should always adjust the schedule to meet those varying needs. If children are hungry before a scheduled mealtime, it's all right, move up your mealtime, uh, feed them a little earlier. I know that um, it was mentioned earlier, if it's raining outside or you know that rain is coming, adjust that outside time so those children still have that um, that time to go out and get that gross motor play out. Always be prepared, prepared for the next activity. Um, children should not have to wait for providers to get materials out and lunch should be prepared before the children sit down to eat. And transitions should be smooth with little waiting times. Um, here, it's, uh, we see a lot of laps. Um, I know Jennifer mentioned laps earlier we're really looking to make sure the children don't have to wait for more than three minutes. Um, and if they do, alternate materials or activities should be accessible to those children. Our next item is free play. Um, this occurs when children are permitted to select materials and companions um, and they're able to play independently or together. Uh, free play should occur both indoors and outdoors. Uh, provider involvement is primarily in response to a child's specific needs. Um, as mentioned before, some children may want you to join in their play and some may be okay if you just check in with them and move on. Non-mobile children need to be offered materials during this time and they need to be moved to different areas to facilitate access. Providers should both supervise and interact with the children during this free play time. Show children how to use and enjoy materials, talk about their play, use a wide variety of words to expand their knowledge and have fun. Uh, you have one of the most interactive, rewarding and entertaining jobs out there. Um, play, sit down and play. I would, as assessors, we love being there and watching your program. And that's one thing that's the hardest for us is we wish that we could join in that play with the children. Um, we've all been teachers ourselves, and we know that that was always the best part of the day. And our last item here is group time. Group time is provider initiated and has the expectation of all children participating. Um, I know, I think I heard Jen mention this during music of movement. Um, if a child doesn't want to be there, if they're not engaged, they're not interested, they should be allowed to leave the group and find another activity to participate in. Um, but we know that if activities are age appropriate, engaging and popular, all the children are gonna to wanna to be involved and engaged. Um, make these group time fun and interactive so the children can be active participants. Uh, 
All right, so now you've heard about a lot of items um, in the scale and you're probably wondering how this is all scored. So let's get a little bit deeper into our scoring system here. Um, the FICRS, as well as all the ERS tools, is scored on a seven point scale. So that's a little different than something you might be used to. Um, this is going to be one as inadequate, three as minimal, five is good, and seven is excellent. And so you might be wondering about those in-between scores of two, four, and six. Well, they're there too. Um, they just um, will be some of the indicators you might meet in the higher um, score and some in the lower score. And so you might see a score in between there too. So let's think of the scoring a little bit. Um, you'll see our graphic here, um, comparing it to ice cream. So you're gonna see at that one level, right? It's an empty bowl. It's waiting to be filled. Um, one of those things that um, at that level one that I really want to point out is a level one might mean kids are at risk. Um, the risk might be one that threatens health, safety, cognitive development, social de development, or even their emotional well-being. So really that empty bowl is really inadequate at one level. Um, next we're going to go up to three, right? Um, you've got a nice soft serve cone. Um, it's good, but it's pretty minimal. It's pretty basic. Um, so these are your basic health and safety um, items here. Um, moving forward, a score of a five is good. So think of it as that delicious triple scoop on a sugar or waffle cone, right? It's just um, increasing that quality. Um, it's developmentally appropriate. It's really good. Then um, moving forward with the score of a seven is going to be excellent. So think of that banana split, lots of flavors and sauces and sprinkles and, and the cherry on top, right? This is enhanced developmental care. Um, this is like the cream of the crop um, doing awesome. So that's one way to look um, at the scoring system um, and how it progresses through. Um, one thing um, that we really want to mention with the scoring, right, um, is just that um, getting all sevens is like climbing Mount Everest, right? That climb should be rewarding. However, very few get to the very top. So um, thinking that you're going to get a score of all sevens is actually an very unrealistic. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, what great start to quality is going to be looking for with your score. Um, on the next slide, you're going to see um, our threshold score. Programs must score a five or above to reach the demonstrating quality level. Now, if you're familiar with um, the revised process for great start to quality, you're going to see the different quality levels. Um, Alrighty. At maintaining health and safety, right? Everyone in good standing with licensing is going to come in at maintaining health and safety. And then you're, um, you might want to do a little bit more. You're going to use quality indicators to reflect on program quality. Um, you'd be going through reflecting on quality, then to enhancing quality, we're going to set goals and receive coaching and consultation. Um, remember, we've talked a lot about using that um, local Great Start to Quality Resource Center. You'll be doing a lot um, in, in that section there. Um, then enhancing quality validated. You're going to complete the validation, and this is the time where you're going to be preparing for that on-site observation. Um, and if you have the on-site observation and you meet a five or above for this FICRS tool, if this is the tool that you choose, um, then you would move into the quality level of demonstrating quality. So you've met that threshold score um, and um, you've moved into demonstrating quality. And one may think, okay, I've met demonstrating quality, I wanna stop here. Well, no, you're gonna get a report. It's gonna give you lots of great information. And um, we hope that you will take that um, to continue to think about quality improvement. Um, there's always things to be done. So um, hopefully you'll find um, that the threshold score of a five at that good level is very supportive. 
Um, and that means that you are, you're doing awesome, um, but we know there's always room for improvement. So we want to continue to think about this as a cyclical process and always trying to strive for better. All right, so here we're going to chat a little bit about the on site observation. Um, so it's going to look similar to um, how we've been handling it before. Um, you will receive a phone call or an email from the assessor as your program is assigned. Um, we'll introduce ourselves, we'll confirm your window on your blockout days. Um, this will be an unannounced visit. Uh, we encourage you to talk with your children about the upcoming visit so they're aware that a new person will be um, visiting your space. And when we arrive, introduce the assessor to the children so they know that we're not a stranger. So we will have to arrive um, when the majority of the children have arrived for the day. Um, we won't be coming early to see those arrivals like we have in the past. When we do arrive, we're going to need to gather some basic information. This information will include the number of children enrolled, the ages of the children present, the max number of children you can have each day, and we also are going to ask if anyone has any identifiable disabilities or if anyone has any food allergies or preferences. Um, this will be a three-hour observation. There's no interview at the end anymore. Uh, we won't be asking questions um, about things we may not have seen. Um, what we observe in the three hour window uh, is what your school score will be based upon. We will be going outside to observe that outdoor play. Um, assessors will always come prepared for the weather. So please don't ever think that you can't um, take your children outside because we're visiting. Um, we will bring our snow pants and our boots um, in the winter. We will bring umbrellas and raincoats if it's raining. Um, we are ready and prepared. Um, we'll try to be a fly on the wall. I know it can be hard um, because it's a new face. We're inside your homes, but we're going to try our best to stay out of the way. Um, that is until we need to peek at your materials, um, but we will try to do that at a time when no one is um, accessing those shelves and items. Um, we're going to watch interactions. Um, we may acknowledge children when they come up to us, but we're gonna just let them know that we're there just to watch and to take notes and of all the fun things they're doing, um, that we're not there to play with them. Uh, as, uh, as the observation is completed, we're going to quietly, um, hopefully without disruption, just let you know that we're finished before we head out the door. All right. So you're probably wondering um, about more information, right? Like this was a lot today and um, you might want some more resources to help guide you um, and support you through this process. So um, the first thing I want to mention is our Great Start to Quality website. And since you're watching this recording, you probably have already found your way to our ERS webpage, um, which is great and exciting. So I'm happy that, that you were able to find this recording. Um, lots of information on our ERS webpage. Um, and hopefully um, you have been able to navigate through some of that. Um, but please make sure that you continue to watch because we're going to continue to update information, um, especially as we field more questions um, and we want to best support you. We're going to put as many things as we can on our website. So it's a good idea to bookmark the Great Start to Quality website. And um, if you are wanting to choose ERS, um, the Fickers tool uh, for your on-site observation, you might even want to bookmark that, that page. Um, on here, uh, the ERS webpage, there's also a link um, to be able to purchase the toolbook. So you might be wondering as you've been going through here, what's the best way for me to get my hands on a book? I know that Jen had mentioned earlier, and again, um, want to tell you to reach out to your Great Start to Quality Resource Center. Um, they'll be able to help you. They'll have books in their lending library. You don't have to purchase anything. But if you'd like to, the toolbook is affordable, and there is a link right on our webpage. All right. 
also um, the Great Start to Quality Assessment Team. Our email is there, assessment at ecic4kids.org. If you're thinking of more questions about the process in general that Haley mentioned or about the Fickers tool or any of the other tools that are options um, for Great Start to Quality, please reach out, feel free to email us. And if we can't help you, we will get you the right um, person who can. Um, you will see on your screen, it says practice ERS. Depending on watching when you're watching this video, um, we are currently um, going out and practicing with the environment rating scale. And so we are looking for family child care providers um, who would be willing to do a practice observation so if that's something that you're interested in, uh, please email us. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to practice with the tool, but for you also to get a little practice with an on-site observation using the Fickers 3 tool. Um, again, we cannot guarantee that we can make it out um, with a practice. And uh, depending on what, when you're watching this recording, um, hopefully practices will still be available for you. All right, well, we just want to thank all of you for taking your time to learn about the Fickers 3 tool. We know we just threw a lot of information at you. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, please pause, um, take time to process and reflect as needed, take breaks. Um, it is a lot of information. Um, as Kristen just noted, also, please reach out with any further questions you may have. Um, our email was on that last slide, which was assessment at ecic4kids.org. And also, like she said, please let us know if you're interested in a practice observation. Um, we all would love to have a little extra um, time out there to help us prepare for what's to come this February. <laughs>